All right. Today I'll be preaching on the love of God or the love of Christ as we see it there in Ephesians 3. I'll show you in Ephesians 3 where we just read. It says here, For this cause I bow my knees unto the Father of our Lord Jesus Christ, of whom the whole family in heaven and earth is named, that he would grant you according to the riches of his glory to be strengthened with might by his spirit in the inner man. So this is what Paul desires for the Ephesians here and what they would know, that Christ may dwell in your hearts by faith, that ye being rooted and grounded in love may be able to comprehend with all saints, and notice this, what is the breadth and length and depth and, and, and depth and height. So if you remember last week when we talked about God being outside of our dimensions, look at what he's saying here. That's, a, that's four dimensions, isn't it? <laughs> Breadth and length and depth and height. And to know the love of Christ, which passeth knowledge, that you might be filled with all the fullness of God. Do you know that God desires that we would know that he loves us? Right, and you probably think in your mind, of course God loves us. But then sometimes you might find yourself saying things like, oh, you know, God doesn't care what I do. Or you might say something like, ah, oh, you know, God is done with me. You know, how can God love me after I do X, Y, and Z? Or you might think to yourself, I don't think God is listening to my prayers. You might say something like, I don't think God can use me anymore. Or you might think something like, how can God love me after what I have done? Or how can God love me even after what I still do? Right? So when we have these thoughts like this, I think it's a good reminder that God loves us, you know, even though we might say that. But then we have these thoughts, don't we? And that shows that we often doubt God's love, even though the Bible is full of God's love for us. And that's what I want to talk about this morning. I want it to be a reminder this morning that uh, God loves you and that uh, we want to talk about the love of Christ. I want to talk about seven ways in which God loves you. So number one, number one, and we also see it in Ephesians as well, is that God created you. You say, yeah, well, maybe God wouldn't have created me if he knew, he knew how I turned out. But I don't know if you've ever heard the saying, did it ever occur to you that nothing ever occurs to God? It means like, think God isn't surprised by things. So even though you, you and all your faults and all the stuff that you've done that you ought to, you know, you're ashamed of and you probably ought to be ashamed of, right? That's, that's how sin ought to make us feel. Knowing that, God still created you. And you know, life is often one of those things that we take for granted. You know, we complain about how life didn't turn out the way we wanted it to and you know, we can't do this and can't do that, or we didn't do this and didn't do that, or didn't get to experience this or experience that, and these plans that I had you know, fell through, and we complain about these things. And often we forget and we take for granted the things that are very basic that God has provided us with, like life, you know, our health, just the, the fact that we exist, the fact that we get to even enjoy the things we do get to enjoy. God is the sustainer and the giver of life. Right, Ephesians 3, it says, "...and to make all men see what is the fellowship of the mystery, which from the beginning of the world hath been hidden God, who created all things by Jesus Christ." Look at Psalm 103. "...know ye that the Lord, He is God. It is He that hath made us, and not we ourselves. We are His people and the sheep of His pasture." We ought to give thanks that we are even alive. I mean, think about what Jesus said, "...what shall profit a man?" If he gain the whole world and lose his own soul, right? That's how valuable your life is. That you that is more valuable than even if you had everything in the world, you ought to trade that to preserve your life, right? God that made the world and all things therein, seeing that he is Lord of heaven and earth, dwelleth not in temples made with hands. This is Paul preaching on Mars Hill to the Athenians, right? Telling them about the unknown God, the one they ignorantly worship. Neither is worshipped with men's hands as though he needed anything, seeing he giveth to all life and breath and all things. And hath made of one blood all nations of men for to dwell on all the face of the earth, 
and hath determined the times before appointed and the bounds of their habitation, that they should seek the Lord, if happily they might feel after him, and find him, though he be not far from every one of us. For in him, look at this, we live and move and have our being. So you see there that God doesn't only just provide us life and then off you go. See, we don't realize that he actually sustains our life. He's the reason why we continue to breathe. You know, people haven't figured out, hey, what holds atoms together? What holds the world together? What's God? God is holding it all together, even though science can't figure it out. They don't want to admit that it is God. For in him we live and move and have our being, as certain also of your own poets have said, for we also for we are also his offspring. So one way God loves us is that he provided you life to begin with. All right, what's the second way that God loves us? And not only does he provide us with life and the fact that we exist, the fact that we get to enjoy everything, but he also provides what we have as well. You know, so he gives us the ability to get well. So we wouldn't even be able to have the things we have if we didn't have the ability to get it to begin with and the opportunities that are presented to us day by day. But even those things that we have on top of that, God provides us with our basic necessities. And that's what we see in Matthew 6, verse 25. Therefore I say unto you, take no thought for your life, what you shall eat or what you shall drink, nor yet for your body. What you shall put on is not the life more than meat and the body than raiment. So this is not talking about not being you know, organized and not being prepared. This is about saying don't, don't worry about these things. Right? You don't worry about it. You do what you can and God will do the rest. Verse 26, Behold the fowls of the air, for they sow not, neither do they reap, nor gather into barns. Yet your heavenly Father feedeth them. Are ye not much better than they? And that's kind of the reminder that we're having this morning. And as sometimes we doubt God's love for us, when God provides for the birds of the field and the lilies of the field, and he says here, are ye not much better than they? Does not God love you more than the bird of the field and the flowers of the field? Of course. Which of you, by taking thought, can add one cubit unto his stature? And why take ye thought for raiment? Consider the lilies of the field, how they grow. They toil not neither do they spin. And yet I say unto you that even Solomon in all his glory was not arrayed like one of these. Wherefore, if God so clothed the grass of the field which today is and tomorrow is cast into the oven, shall he not much more clothe you, O ye of little faith? Right? And that's what it comes down to, right? When we doubt God's love for us, it's a faith issue, isn't it? We're not trusting God's word because God's word hasn't changed. God's word still tells us the same yesterday and today and forever that God loves, you know, his children. But it's a faith issue, right? So when we don't feel loved, it's not that God has changed. It's that something in us has changed, right? Therefore take no thought, saying, What shall we eat, or what shall we drink, or wherewithal shall we be clothed? For after all these things do the Gentiles seek. For your heavenly Father knoweth that you have need of all these things, but seek ye first the kingdom of God and his righteousness, and all these things shall be added unto you. Take therefore no thought for the morrow, for the morrow shall take thought for the things of itself. Sufficient unto the day is the evil thereof. You know, often when we love somebody, you know, we want to give them things. And God gives us many things that are so much more valuable than the things that we would receive in this world. James 1.17, every good gift is in every perfect gift is from above and cometh down from the Father of lights, with whom is no variableness, neither shadow of turning. So you see, everything we have comes from God and the ability to even obtain those things. We never want to be too high-minded to think, ah, oh, look at you know, all these things that I have done. Remember, that's what Nebuchadnezzar said. You know, when he walked out, he looked at his kingdom and look at this great kingdom that I have built. And then what happened? And he you know, it was given the mind of an animal, driven out into the wilderness. So you can see, you know, without the wisdom that we have, you know, the mind that we have, the ability that we have, I mean, can we obtain anything that we have? We need to remember to give thanks to God. That's one way God loves us, is he provides these things for us. So not only life, but he provides material things as well for us, the things that we have to enjoy. Number three, what else, how else does God love you? 
Number three is he does what is best for you. So we don't want to get caught up in just like God just gives and gives and gives and think God is like some heavenly, you know, Santa Claus that we just like ask whatever we want and he just gives it to us. No, he does what's best for you. And this is why sometimes you might ask for something and you might not get it. Sometimes you, you, you get something that you didn't ask for, but it's good for you. Right? And God allows these things in your life. Why? Because he's trying to make it hard for you? No, it's because he loves you and he knows that this hardship is going to grow you, it's going to mold you. It's out of love. It's a reminder that God loves you, that he allows you to go through hard times. Philippians 1.29, For unto you it is given in the behalf of Christ not only to believe on him. So notice that. See, you know, sometimes when we go soul winning and we tell people, oh, you know, if you believe on Christ... You know, and then you'll be saved, and then they, they always say, well, then what's the point of going to church? What's the point of... Well, it's because it's not only given up to you on behalf of Christ just to believe on him, right? There's other things for you to do. We're just talking about how to be saved. You know, yeah, you believe on him to be saved, but this is not all God has given unto you, wants you to do, but also to suffer for his sake, having the same conflict which he saw in me and now here to be in me. So you see, God doesn't just always, just isn't always positive. Because sometimes what's best for you is something, a little negativity in your life to grow you, right? To make you suffer and to, to mold your character to be more like Jesus Christ. I mean, think about it. Are we better than Jesus Christ? Was Jesus' life just happy and wealthy and everything was going well? No, he went through suffering. In fact, the Bible says he was made perfect through suffering, right? So that's why God allows us to go through suffering because he's bettering us. Hebrews 12, not only does he allow us to suffer, look at what it says here in Hebrews 12, and you have forgotten the exhortation which speaketh unto you as unto children, my son, despise not thou the chastening of the Lord, nor faint when thou art rebuked of him. So not only is he allowing us to go through hard times to make us better, but when we do wrong things, he's chastening us. And God, you know, he can chasten us in all sorts of different ways. Right? He's not limited to how he chastens us, but he can make life hard for us if we are naughty. Right? For whom the Lord loveth, he chasteneth, and scourgeth every son whom he receiveth. That's what I want you to focus on today when we talk about the Lord's chastening. God's chastening is not out of hatred and indignation. This is not a curse God is putting on you. That's Old Testament. right? That's the Old Covenant that God Jesus took for us. He was made a curse for us, right? So that we could receive the blessings. This is not talking about the cursing of God. This is talking about God's love for us as a heavenly father wanting to correct his children that go astray, right? So you don't want to despise the chastening of the Lord. Don't faint, don't quit when you're rebuked of him. For whom the Lord loveth, he chasteneth, and scourgeth every son whom he receiveth. If ye endure chastening, God dealeth with you as with sons. For what son is he whom the Father chasteneth not? But if ye be without chastisement, whereof all our partakers, then are ye bastards and not sons. Right? So the Bible's saying here, if God doesn't chasten you, he doesn't love you. What are you, uh, an illegitimate son? That's what a bastard is. An illegitimate child rather than an actual child of God? No. God, when you are a believer on Jesus Christ, God deals with you as a father. So he's going to you know, put you, set you right back, you know, maybe bring some things in your life to refocus you back on him and where you should be heading. And here in James 4, look, sometimes when we ask for things, that doesn't mean God is necessarily going to give it to us. James 4, ye ask and receive not, because ye ask amiss, that ye may consume it upon your lusts. I mean, have you ever asked for something from God and you, you never really considered God in that prayer request? You never really considered whether it furthers the kingdom of God, whether it was a good thing for you. It's just something you wanted. But sometimes you don't get it. Why? Because God knows maybe you're just asking it out of your own desire as opposed to asking it for the right reason. And he doesn't always give us what we ask for. But he does what is best for us. That's number three. So he, he created us. He provides for us. He does what's best for you. Number four is... He listens to you. He listens to you. You know, maybe you don't have somebody that listens to you very well. But God is somebody that listens to you. 
Maybe you're not a very good listener yourself. Sometimes I'm not always a very good listener. Have you ever tried to listen to somebody? I know sometimes I have to think my wife. I gotta say, like, sorry, Elizabeth, I wasn't listening. My wife was actually somewhere else. Make her repeat herself. But uh, you know, sometimes we're like that, right? We're not really fully paying attention. We're pretending like we're listening, but our mind is somewhere else. God is not like that. You know, God, when you speak to God, He listens to you. You know, we have that assurance, and He because He loves us. First Peter 5, casting all your care upon him. Look at this, casting all your care upon him. It's not casting some of your care upon him. Not casting upon him the care that you think he cares about. It's casting all your care upon him. Why? For he careth for you. Because he cares for you. Right? Sometimes we doubt this, don't we? We don't believe this. That's why it's an issue of faith, isn't it? See, do you really believe that God cares about the things you bring for him? Well, he's telling you here, casting all your care upon him, for he careth for you. Philippians 4, be careful for nothing. So remember, care in the Bible is often worry, concern. Be careful for nothing, but in everything, by prayer and supplication with thanksgiving. Let your requests be made known unto God, and the peace of God, which passeth all understanding, shall keep your hearts and minds through Christ Jesus. Jesus. And you know the great thing about God, not only that he listens to us, but he listens to us patiently. He doesn't mind that we come back to him. And the Bible uses this term, like he doesn't upbraid us, upbraid us, right? He upbraideth not. What does that mean? He doesn't, he doesn't tell us off for coming to him too often, right? James 1.5. Often we are like that, right? Often we don't have the love that God has. People come to us, we start getting a little bit, ah, you know, stop bugging me, right? God is not like that. That's how much God loves you, that he wants you to come to him and he doesn't get impatient with you. If any of you lack wisdom, look at this, let him ask of God that give it to all men liberally and upbraideth not. That means he doesn't tell you off and it shall be given him. But let him ask in faith, nothing wavering. For he that wavereth is like a wave of the sea, driven with the wind and tossed. For let not that man think that he shall receive anything of the Lord. A double-minded man is unstable in all his ways. Right? So God listens to us. He's ready to listen to us. And often we don't use that avenue as much as we should. Right? Sometimes we'll go through hard times or we'll go through something tough and we'll just think, oh, you know, I'm, I'm on my own. You know, I just got to rough it through. But that's not true. You have a, you have a God there that will listen to you. You know, that, will, that you know, may help you if you will only ask him for that help. And maybe he's just waiting for you to ask for that help. So to show that you trust him, you know, and if you're going to go at it on your own, maybe he'll let you do that so that you'll have to learn the hard way. But oftentimes we don't seek that help as often as we should. But God is there for us. And that's a, it's a beautiful thing that even though we take his presence for granted, he's still there for us even when we come to him and he upbraideth not. All right, number five is, not only does he listen to us and he's there and he's patient with us, but he's a God that understands you. And he understands what you're going through. You know, oftentimes it's, it helps to have somebody that can relate to your struggles. And that's why you never want to be discouraged when you go through hard times because that's going to allow you to relate better to somebody else, right? When you have to give them encouragement, when you have to uh, help them go through hard times. Well, God is the same. Jesus Christ is the same. He's not somebody that doesn't understand what we go through. And, you know, he's not a God that's in an ivory tower that's high and lifted up, that has no idea what his creation goes through. He actually put on flesh and was tempted, like as we are, yet without sin. That's what we see in Hebrews 4. Look at this in verse 14. Seeing then that we have a great high priest that is passed into the heavens, Jesus, the Son of God, let us hold fast our profession. For we have not an high priest which cannot be touched with the feeling of our infirmities. So it's saying here, that's not what our high priest is like. Our high priest is not somebody who doesn't understand what we go through, but was in all points tempted like as we are, yet without sin. And like I talked about before, you know, uh, we are not, you know, we live a much easier life than what Jesus Christ went through. So anytime we get that thought, Jesus doesn't understand what I'm going through, or he doesn't, he doesn't know what I, he doesn't understand what I feel, we're kidding ourselves. 
Right? Oh, ye of little faith. Jesus understands hardship, trials and temptations to a much greater degree, I'm sure, than many of us. I mean, look at what uh, you know, we see him here. 40 days and 40 nights without food, tempted by Satan himself. I don't think there's many of us that can say we've experienced this level of temptation, even though we think, oh, you know, I'm being tempted so much. Luke 4, 1. Jesus, being full of the Holy Ghost, returned from Jordan and was led by the Spirit into the wilderness, being 40 days tempted of the devil, and in those days he did eat nothing. Excuse me, he did eat nothing. And when they were ended, he afterward and hungered. So not only did Jesus experience trial, the temptation in the wilderness, but there were often times where Jesus didn't even have somewhere to sleep. So he, see, he understands when people go without. Right? Sometimes when people lose everything or when people are financially struggling, Jesus understands that. There was, I mean, Jesus didn't have a lot either. Look at this, in Luke 9, 57, it came to pass that as they went in their way, a certain man said unto him, Lord, I will follow thee whithersoever thou goest. And Jesus said unto him, Foxes have holes, and birds of the air have nests, but the Son of Man hath not where to lay his head. You see, that's what the guy is saying, hey, I want to follow you wherever you go, and he's warning him. He's saying, you know what? Foxes have a home, the holes, right? Birds have nests, they have a home to go to. He's saying, you want to follow me? I don't even have somewhere where I'm going to sleep. Right? So he's letting him know, you know the type of journey he's going to go on if he really wants to follow Jesus. And this is uh, physically here in, this, in these uh, uh, travels. Matthew 26. How else does Jesus understand us? Well, Jesus understands fear as well, doesn't he? Jesus understands fear. Sometimes we glaze over these passages, but... You know, it's good sometimes to sit and just read these and reflect on what Jesus was feeling when he prayed in the Garden of Gethsemane. Matthew 26, 36. Then cometh Jesus with them unto a place called Gethsemane, and saith unto the disciples, Sit ye here, while I go and pray yonder. And he took with him Peter and the two sons of Zebedee, and began to be sorrowful, and very heavy. Why? Because he knows what he's about to go through. And it's not that he was, you know, yeah, is he, he's God in the spirit of God, right? But his humanity, he's also a man. He gets fearful, right? In terms of what he has to go through, the, the heaviness of what he's about to go through. And we see here also how he responds, how he trusts God and he leans on God for that strength. Matthew 26, 38. Then saith he unto them, my soul is exceeding sorrowful even unto death. Tarry ye here and watch with me. And he went a little further and fell on his face and prayed, saying, O oh, Father, if it be possible, let this cup pass from me. Nevertheless, not as I will, but as thou wilt. So that's why when the Bible says, you know, we have not a high priest which cannot be touched with the feeling of our infirmities, I mean, you can take that seriously. You can take that to the bank. That Jesus knows what you're going through. You know, so when you pray to God, like Jesus is here, God understands you he, he, and he listens to you. This is one way God, you know, loves you. Where we don't always show that perfect love, do we? But God loves us like this. Number six, we've got two more. Number six is God is always with you. Jesus is always with you. You know, you may have friends and family and whatnot turn their back on you. Maybe you've had somebody betray you. Maybe you've somebody not stand with you in your time of need. Jesus is not like that. Jesus is always with you and will stand with you. You never walk alone, right? in your Christian life, even though sometimes you may feel alone, like Job felt alone when he was going through those trials and tribulations. And also, you know, you remember that, that sort of uh, parable that people say about the footprints in the sand. You know, if you don't know them, you know, there's two footprints in the sand, and that represented somebody's life. And when he looks at his life, he looks at the footprints in the sand, sometimes he only sees one set of footprints. 
And he asked God, when he says, God, how come, you know, whenever it was the hardest times in my life, you left me. There's only one set of footprints in the sand. And God responds to him, no, my child, those one set of footprints in the sand. He says, that is when I carried you. <laughs> so while he thought God had abandoned him in his most hardest times of his life, that's where God actually carried him through those things. And I think that's a good reminder that Jesus is always with us. He doesn't abandon us. Matthew 28, Jesus came and spake unto them, saying, All power is given unto me in heaven and in earth. Go ye therefore and teach all nations, baptizing them in the name of the Father and of the Son and of the Holy Ghost, teaching them to observe all things whatsoever I have commanded you. And lo, I am with you always, even unto the end of the world. Amen. Look at what he says in Matthew 18, 20. For where two or three are gathered together in my name, there am I in the midst of of them. So you see, it's not God is only with us when we're serving. God is not only with us when we're gathered two or three in his name. But look at what it says here in 2 Corinthians 13. Examine yourselves, whether ye be in the faith. Prove your own selves. Know ye not your own selves, how that Jesus Christ is in you, except ye be reprobate. I see how Jesus Christ is in you. Jesus Christ lives in you. He's always with you, teaching you, right? Because we learned about last week, you know, these three are one. So God is always with us. Colossians 1.27, To whom God would make known what is the riches of the glory of this mystery among the Gentiles, which is Christ in you, the hope of glory. Hebrews 13, verse 5. Let your conversation be without covetousness and be content with such things as you have, for he hath said, I will never leave thee nor forsake thee. Now we always use this verse, or I always use this verse to describe eternal security. Now people say, oh yeah, well God will never leave me, but I can leave God. But the thing is, if you try and leave God, he's just going to stay right there with you. You can't leave him. Because he's never going to forsake you. You can try and forsake him, but he's going to be right there with you as you're trying to forsake him. So he had said, I will never leave thee nor forsake thee. See, that's how much God loves you. So that even when you forsake him, he still loves you. So that we may boldly say, the Lord is my helper, and I will not fear what man shall do unto me. Right? He's always with you. And the last one we want to talk about is God's love for you is unconditional. It's unconditional. Now, another way we can describe this is he loves you eternally. And oftentimes we'll say to people, you know, the gift of God is not conditional life. But right? it's not that you have life and the love, you know, God's love until you mess up. Right? It's eternal life because whether you mess up or not, you always have God's love. And that's true unconditional love. Unconditional love is no matter what state you are in, God's love is always there. He may relate to you differently in the terms of, you know, how he deals with you, right, based on your relationship, but his love never diminishes for you if you are his child, right? Well, the assumption here is that you believed on Jesus, right? You have to believe on Jesus Christ. That is how we access the love of God. Those who reject the love of God will experience God's wrath and indignation in hell. But if we accept God's love through Jesus Christ, this is what we receive. Romans 8.35 Who shall separate us from the love of Christ? Shall tribulation or distress or persecution or famine or nakedness or peril or sword as it is written, for thy sake we are killed all the day long. We are counted as sheep for the slaughter. Now, in all these things, we are more than conquerors through him that loved us. For I am persuaded that neither death, nor life, nor angels, nor principalities, nor powers, nor things present, nor things to come, nor height, nor depth, nor any other creature shall be able to separate us from the love of God, which is in Christ Jesus. And yet after a passage like that, some people can say, yeah, but I can walk away from God. I mean, do you, really, do you really think once you're saved, you can get away from God when he's trying to make it abundantly clear that nothing 
can separate you from the love of God, which is in Christ Jesus our Lord. And for somebody to think, yeah, well, yeah, but if I walk away from God, yeah, then he won't love me anymore. Of course not. That's why it's eternal life. We're forever saved. And thank God for that. So not only are we forever saved, you know, there are implications to this doctrine when we think about it. See, if I'm saved, no matter what I do, there's nothing I can do more to make Jesus, there's nothing I can do to make Jesus love me anymore. Did you know that? Did you know there's nothing you can do to make God love you more than he does now? And likewise, there's nothing you can do that will make God love you any less. <laughs> right? So, this is, like I said in the beginning, did it ever occur to you that nothing ever occurred to God? You know, when Jesus died on the cross, did he die just for your sins in the past? No. He died for your sins in the future. So why, he died for your sins in the future as well. So why do we, when we do something, and, you know, rightfully so, we should be ashamed of what we do, of whatever sin it is, you know, maybe we've sinned against God and we should be ashamed, that we think, God doesn't love me. Well, God won't love me because I, I can't believe if God knows that I'm like this, how could he love me? Well, the thing is, he, well, he knew that. And he died on the cross anyway. So it's not that he didn't know everything that you were going to do in your life. You know, it's not like he, you know, if I knew that, then I wouldn't have gone to the cross for you. He knew your whole future and he died on the cross anyway. And that's why when we talk about eternal security, you know, this is really God's love, unconditional love expressed. Because there's nothing you can do to earn salvation. There's nothing you can do to lose it. And likewise, there's nothing you can do to earn God's love. And there's nothing you can do to make him love you any less. God loves you the same way because he knew everything about you. Even, when, you know, the day you got saved, right? The day you accepted his love. He already knew everything you've done, everything you will do. Nothing surprises God. So not only that, so whenever we doubt God's love for us, or we feel we're not loved, we have to remember that Jesus Christ coming to this world and dying for us on the cross is the very proof that God loves you. You know, you say, how do I know God loves me? Well, the very fact that Jesus came into this world, died on a cross, rose again for you, that is the proof. If we wouldn't need anything else, right? That's the proof that God loves us. And he loves us not only in our good times, but he loves us even while we were sinners. I don't know if you ever thought about this verse in this way, but this is how it describes Romans 5. Romans 5 verse 6. For when we were yet without strength, in due time, Christ died for the ungodly. For scarcely for a righteous man will one die, yet peradventure for a good man. Some would even dare to die. What is it saying here? Verse 6 and 7. It says Christ died for the ungodly. Right? He didn't die for the people that deserved it. He died for all of us and none of us deserved it. And it's saying here, scarcely for a righteous man will one die. It's very rare that somebody would die for a righteous person, let alone an ungodly person. And it's just repeating it here. Yet peradventure for a good man, some would even dare to die. I right? just saying it's very rare to die for a righteous man or even a good man. And here's the famous verse in Romans 5 8. But God commendeth his love toward us, in that while we were yet sinners, Christ died for us. You see, we were enemies of God, and yet he died for us. This is the ultimate example of Love ye your enemies. John 15, verse 12. This is my commandment, that ye love one another as I have loved you. Greater love hath no man than this, that a man lay down his life for his friends. You see here that God proved his love to us when he came and died for us on the cross. This is why I love the way that 1 John 4 writes this. It says, Beloved, beloved let us love one another, for love is of God, and everyone that loveth is born of God, and knoweth God. He that loveth not knoweth not God, for God is love. And remember when I was talking to you about the proof of God's love? You ever questioned God's love? 
Jesus Christ is the proof that God loves you. Look at this. In this was manifested. What does it mean to manifest, to make known, to reveal? In this was manifested the love of God toward us because that God sent His only begotten Son into the world that we might live through Him. Herein is love. Not that we loved God, but that He loved us and sent His Son to be the propitiation for our sins. Beloved, if God so loved us, we ought also to love one another. All right, so I hope that was a good reminder for you this morning. You know, it's, it's good. You know, our Christian life, we go up and down in our Christian life. And uh, you don't want to be too imbalanced. You don't want to be just too focused on, say, doctrine, or too focused on judgment and, you know, the negativity. But also a reminder that God loves you. You know, we all need that reminder sometimes that, you know, when we go through a bit of a lull in our Christian life, maybe you're not where you, you know, want to be in your Christian life. Maybe you've done things that you might be ashamed of. Hey, it's a good reminder that God loves you and that ought to compel you to change, to want to do something different. So how does God love you? He created you, provides for you. He does what's best for you. He listens to you. He understands you. He's always with you. And he loves you unconditionally. So let's close on just this one last verse. 2 Corinthians 5. For the love of Christ constraineth us. What does that mean? It's, it's like it's, we're holding to it. We don't have a choice, right? We're forced. The love of Christ constraineth us. Because we thus judge that if one died for all, then we're all dead. And that he died for all, that they which live should not henceforth live unto themselves, but unto him which died for them and rose again. And this is my hope for you this morning, that if you reflect on the love of God and you reflect on how much God loves you, that that will drive you, that will constrain you, like the Bible says, to want to serve Him. Because that's the ultimate motivator, right? The ultimate motivator should not be what other people think or because I have to. The ultimate motivator is you do it because you are grateful for what God does for you, how He loves you, and that ought to drive you to want to do something for Him. All right, let's pray. Lord, thank you so much for your love and thank you so much for the reminder this morning that, Lord, we come short every day. Uh, we are not deserving of your love, but we thank you, Lord, that you love us the same yesterday, today, and forever. I pray, Lord, that this love that we have from you will drive us to, to serve you with our life. Um, and I pray these things in Jesus' name. Amen.